Hello, this is Susan Bird, and you are listening to the Curated Conversations Podcasts. In this series, East Meets West and Vice Versa, we're exploring the new conversations taking place between Asia and the West on a variety of subjects. With me today is Kui Pu Li, who is Chinese, was born in China, went to school there, and in fact attended foreign language school there before coming to the United States in 2009 to attend Bryn Mawr as an undergraduate. She received her undergraduate degree from Bryn Mawr, then returned to Shanghai, where she worked with a program at NYU Shanghai on a fellowship, and then came back to the United States to get a master's at Columbia Teachers College, which she's just completing this year. While she's been here this summer, she's been working as an intern for TED, which is where she and I have met. She works for the TEDx Applications team, which uh, reviews TEDx license applications, and she makes sure that people who are renewing these licenses really know what they're doing with these events and that they have effective uh, brand issues handled well, which she would have a great deal to say about since she's totally fluent in English, knows everything about China, and seems to know an awful lot about the United States as well. So welcome, Kui Pu. Thank you so much, Susan. Now, you say when you're in China, your name is pronounced differently, right? Or at least you put you put your last name first that we would think. The family name goes first. So how would you say it in China? Right. So in Mandarin, it would be Li Hui Pu. Um, so Li is my family name. A name, last name, and Hui Pu is my first name. Uh, but here in the United States, um, I figure it's hard enough for <laughs> American people who don't speak Chinese to pronounce my name, um, even without tongues. So I just, whenever I introduce myself, I just say, Oh, I'm Hui Pu. I just remove the tongues for them. And it, you're just making it easier for all of us, yeah. which we appreciate a great deal. Which actually is, is relative to this conversation mm-hmm. because I'm especially interested in the ways that the conversation generally that takes place between Asia and the West, in this case specifically China, has changed over the years, Mm -hmm. especially in these last several years of high innovation, tremendous growth in China, changes in China on every level, Mm -hmm. and the relationship between the U.S. and China has changed a great deal. So I'd be interested just from your perspective, you came here in the first time in 2009. Right. Has there been a difference in the way people here think and talk about China from your observation? I would say definitely because um, when I first arrived here, I would say uh, around me, not many people that I know studied Chinese, the language. Um, most of them have never heard about the hometown, my hometown, the city I'm, I came from. Uh, although Chengdu is actually one of the largest cities in China, it's certainly not as famous, not as popular as you know Beijing or Shanghai. So less known to a lot of the foreigners. Uh, but now I've noticed more and more people that I just like strangers I meet in my daily life. Many of them are, sh- are showing interest in learning the language, Chinese language, or are currently learning the language, and more people seem to be aware of the city where I come from. I, w- I, w- I was really surprised. How big is Chengdu? Chengdu is actually really big. Chengdu has over 10 million people. 10 million people? I think so. Um, it, it should be like the sixth or seventh largest cities in China, if I remember it correctly. Um, it's it's one of the largest cities in southwestern um, China, very close to Chongqing, um, and is known as the hometown for pandas, um, because most of the pandas on Earth are from somewhere near Chengdu. <laughs> That's so much fun. So tell me, there. so people in your observation are more interested in learning the language, mm-hmm. seem to be more intelligent or knowledgeable about cities in China. Yes. Has their attitude changed over the time about what China is, how it thinks, what they should think about it? Um, I think once you start to learn a language, you will, it just, it just comes very natural. You'll start to learn about the cultures of that language. And then 
you naturally just get into you know this whole thing about learning a little bit more about the history of China, the current society of China, and every aspect of Chinese culture in general. With that kind of understanding, I think、um, the people who I interact with, who are starting on this track, are in general more interested in getting to know、uh, about Chinese people, and they're more willing to engage in a conversation whenever they meet Chinese people, Chinese foreign、um, students who are studying abroad in China,、uh, in the United States. So for me, I feel like they're they're much more、um, open to. Getting to know more about the Chinese society, which to me is just very different from、um, so, uh, from my ear- earliest years, like around two thousand or two thousand nine or two thousand ten, when I met a lot of people who don't know much about the Chinese culture. They seem to be less curious about my background、um, and also my country in general. Did you find that there was any sense of animosity? Uh, from Americans to China when you first came, or even do you observe any of it now?、Mm, and mostly in terms of meaning people who dislike or are afraid of the Chinese. I think I think people around me or in general just not know much about China in general, so they don't necessarily have a strong opinion, like one way or the other. They some of them might. Be heard about you know political issues or human rights issues about China from news media, so they might have some opinions on that, but not necessarily like about China in general. But I do、um, I do notice that、um, when whenever I'm around, they're more cautious or aware of talking about issues related to China and trying not to offend me.、Um, and I think it's really it's just really、um, people are very considerate around me. Um, regardless of whether they are、uh, they're interested in my culture or not, they're always very mindful of trying not to offend me. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about the other way around.、Mm-hmm. How curious are the Chinese about America, the West in general, but especially America, and how knowledgeable are they? I heard, for example, recently、mm-hmm. that there are more Chinese studying English than there are English speakers in the world. Oh really? That's、wow. what I heard. I don't know if that's true, but it's pretty impressive if it, if it is. And you have the numbers that it could be possible. That's true. So, from your opinion, how how does that look? Are people curious about America? Do they? Is it what they see in the movies that they think it is? How different was it when you showed up here from what you had expected? Oh wow, that's. That's a good question and a hard one to answer. But speaking from my own personal experience, I think back in middle school and high school.、Um, so first, first regarding the number that there are more Chinese people that are now learning English than English speak,、uh, native speakers, which might be very true because English is required in the curriculum starting from back. Back when I was in school, starting in middle school, it was required curriculum.、Um, in middle school, in high school, and it was required subject、um, in the college entrance examination.、Um, but now I think that number is probably even earlier. Like kids probably start to learn English in primary school. So I'm not surprised that there are a lot of a lot a lot of people in China learning English. And as I said, the way we studied English back then was, you know, from textbook. But the textbooks、um, stories were based in English-speaking countries like UK, United States, or Australia, Canada. So I've definitely heard and learned about the cultures、um, of the United States、um, before coming before coming to the United States. From textbook、um, in English class as well as like world history class,、um, it is it was very different from I I would say it's quite different from what I experienced in my freshman year、uh, when I first came here. A lot of the things I learned about United States back when I was in China、uh, was either very outdated, like in history this happened. Like in Philadelphia, two hundred years ago, this happened, or situated in 
like drama, like uh, movies or uh, sitcoms or you know like this pop culture kind of uh, context. Like I watched uh, High School Musical when I was in high school, and I, I I was very surprised to see oh that was actually happened in high school, and I had the feeling that. All the American high schools look like what's happening in the High School Musical, and I was like, "Oh, so American teenagers actually live a life like that, which is kind of crazy." <laughs> that that was just that's very very different from Chinese high school. But I was like, "Oh, that's interesting."、Um, later, I learned that's not true. That's not how every high school looks like. Of course, it's like you know, it's a it's a it's a movie,、uh, but just to get. Getting just to give you a sense of how people、um, learn about American culture,、um, we we learn about it through pop culture.、Um, I think nowadays,、um, as more and more Chinese people、um, come come to the United States、uh, to study abroad, they also bring back more information,、uh, which are actually real life information.、Um, Not as fictional as those pop culture references.、Um, so there are more and more. There, there are actually a lot of resources online to help Chinese students who want to study abroad, to help them introduce different differences between this school and that school. What's the difference between a comprehensive college, a comprehensive university versus a liberal arts college? Which was I have no idea back when I was applying for colleges. Those resources were very limited, and it was hard for me to even find anyone who graduated from Brimmer College so that I could, I could contact with.、Uh, but now there are a lot of people that you can easily just find, you know, on social media or through other、um, platforms.、Um, so I would say, I would say definitely,、um, kids now <laughs> have much better.、Um, At least resources、uh, if they really want to know what's going on in the United States, the real life United States. So let's talk about your return to this、mm-hmm. country that you were born and raised in. After all these experiences in the United、mm-hmm. States, you have pretty big career plans. It、sounds to me like you could be one of those people responsible for really changing the way the educational system in China works. Oh, thank you. So, what are your ambitions? What would you love to have happen with all the learning that you've done, especially with this teachers' college diploma?、Um, I would really、um, like to work in the field of education to address the issues, including、um, education equity, especially equal access to educational resources.、Um, There is a huge gap、um, between the urban and rural students' population、um, in terms of their access to educational resources in China, and I would really like to work for organizations or companies that address issues like that.、Um, and I would also love to see more and more innovations in the field of education to diversify、um, different、uh, opportun- educational opportunities for、um, student groups. Right now, the educational system is very centralized,、um, and most Chinese students will tell you they have a very similar high school and middle school experience compared to in the United States. Like、um, middle school, high school experiences、um, vary drastically depending on which state you're from, or、uh, which culture, cul-、um, culture, or which community you're from. But in China, it was very standardized in terms of the curriculum, in terms of、um, the school setup and administra- administrative side, and everyone goes through the same um, system, um, testing exam system,、um, the entrance examination for college. So you study the same thing,、um, basically.、Um, I would I would love to see more alternatives to this single route、um, into college. I would love to see. Um, there's more space for students to explore what's the best um, um, education or school tr- school choices for them.、Um, how how would you widen it? What are the areas that are not given much attention now that you'd like to see expanded? Definitely, I would love to see、um, more time and space given to students rather than completely structured by courses by the school.、Um, so. To give you an example, 
when I was in high school, um, the three years, with, with, uh, the Chinese education system is six years primary school, three years middle school, and three years high school. And for the entire high school career, you are just preparing for this entrance examination uh, for college. And you, you spend the, three, uh, the first two years or one and a half years study all the things. Uh, for the exam, and then you spend the rest one or one and a half years just review, do rounds and rounds of reviews to prepare for the exam. And the exam is really high stake because that single score at the end will determine which university you can apply to. Um, so most students are under such high pressure, as well as the parents and schools, that they don't really like they can't really um, afford to give students, it feels uh, seems to me, they can't really afford to give students space or time to for them to explore anything out, outside the curriculum, outside the exams required. Um, and I remember back in high school, my schedules were every day. Um, I have like three hours time to myself, but those three hours were filled with homework. Like I finished a homework assignment, I probably have 20, 20 minutes left to myself that I can read some novels or um, play some music if I want. That's it. Um, it's very, it's very rigid and it's very um, super scheduled. There is very little flexibility um, in space. One of the issues that always comes up in conversations I have with business leaders in both the West and, mm -hmm. and China. Uh, about changes in business mm -hmm. is that innovation is so key yes. and that in China the educational system is set up in such a way that it doesn't encourage innovation because people not only are not encouraged to question everything mm -hmm. the way they might in schools in the West or at least that's some people's perception of education here right. but also that there just isn't the kind of a, a rigor around things to which there is not a ready answer, that there is not that much kind of exploration. Mm -hmm. So I'd be curious about your thoughts about that, because once having graduated from schools in China, then one wonders, where does the innovation come from? Is, is that an appropriate analysis of what goes on in terms of the ability of kids to really explore things to which there is not a ready answer? I would say there's definitely uh, a lot of merit to that statement. Um, I, first of all, we, when, whenever we talk about creativity, um, I think it's crucial that we do not narrow the creativity down to just artistic creativity, um, which is a lot of the time, oftentimes, when, whenever people talk about creativity, they assume it's associated with art or sports or um, anything that's not academic. Um, I think there is creativity embodying every everything um, that you do. Uh, you can be create, creative um, in problem solving. You can be creative in terms of the way you study new things. Um, those to me are also creativity. That kind of creativity are definitely um, cultivated through the learning that we went through. Like I, I would say a lot of the very strong um, students um, in terms of academic performance back in China, they, if you give them space, give them the right resources and allow them to ask questions, allow them to uh, pursue whatever they want to, they grow so fast because they have the ability to study and they know how to tackle questions, how to, if they have a question, they, if they can't figure out a problem, how to tackle that question because that's what we that's what we were trained to do for 12 years. We repeated doing things and then we figure out our own problem. We, every day we think about how to increase the marks, how to answer this question correctly. But then there are kind of systematic way um, in the thinking, uh, a bit, um, learning happening here. I think it's, um, it, it will be, it will be, it will be definitely wrong if we just ignore saying, oh, you know, preparing for exams doesn't really help you grow that kind of um, uh, ability. I don't, I don't think so. I think there's definitely um, that part we need to acknowledge. But on the other hand, I agree that if you're only, uh, the Chinese system now only emphasizes on having students 
to study, to prepare for the exam, and to pre prepare for a set of questions that are half the answers, half the standard answer at the end, which is definitely limiting students' ability to um, explore on their own and to study things on their own. I think I I um, I recall my first and second year back in uh, undergrad. I have um, I kind of came to the realization that I um, so back in back back when I was in uh, Bryn Mawr College, I was a math major. Um, so I was always um, interested in math in middle school and high school, and I did pretty well in general for math um, in high school. Um, so when I started at college um, and I took calculus course and I took some uh, real analysis course, I was doing pretty well in those in those courses. But my professor was constantly saying uh, when he worked with me to solve the problem, he always say, "Hui Pu, slow down. How did you how did you come to this step? I don't I don't see it." So I, every time I'm like, "Oh, it's so natural because you want to get the derivative, so you always do this, so you always do that." He's like, "But why?" And now I'm like, why? That's just how you do. And then like, and then I just realized, oh, that I, I I thought it was that's just how you do because that's how I was trained. Like in China, in math courses, in a math math class, you're not um, you're not pushed to think about why you why you take the derivative for this question. You're not pushed to think about that. You're just like, oh, for questions like this, you always take the derivative. And that would solve the problem. And then, while it is cool that I can solve that set of set, set of problems, it never just come. It, it's not really mathematical thinking. I would say it's not really this kind of critical thinking that pushed me to solve a, solve the problem because I'm not actually questioning why I'm doing every step. I'm not aware um, why I'm doing this. So, I think the first two years, I actually uh, throughout my math courses. I was actually constantly reminding myself, oh yes, I now need to actually understand every step mathematically, and then to really study, really start to form, um, formulate this kind of mathematical thinking um, through the exercises. Um, I pick again, I pick up very quickly because I have a good foundation um, of the, I have a good um, sense feeling of math from what I learned from middle school and high school, but. It is this kind of new way of thinking that helped me to actually. I'm I'm, I'm much much more confident after um, my uh, undergrad saying, "Oh, now I understand why how math works. Now I can solve the problems, even if I know I don't really know this theory, and I don't really know this concept. I can always find a way to understand them and approach this question because I know how to think mathematically." I think for me that's a huge jump from what I've what I was trained in middle school and high school. Does that make sense? Yes, tremendous sense. So it's really that all the discipline is there, but the ability to really extrapolate because you end up with the tools that create critical thinking yes. is something that you learned as an undergrad here at Bryn Mawr. Yes. So is it that kind of thinking that is at the heart of your desire to expand education in China? You'd like to see that kind of critical thinking as part of every kid's opportunity yes, to learn. definitely. Now, you had mentioned to me that there are families that are so, it, it's, it's such a major concern to them that they get mm -hmm. uh, a, a more expansive way of educating their own kids, that they have, let me see if I got this right, they actually go and form small communities in a suburb outside a major city, and they set up a school, and they set yes. up teachers, and they're doing that? Tell yes. me about that. That's amazing. Yes. I heard about, I first heard about schools like this um, a few years ago. Um, I heard about a group of parents um, set up this kind of schools or classes, homeschool. But it's 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 really a homeschool kind of community um, outside um, in Guangdong province, and they're doing they're basically homeschooling their kids um, as a few parents uh, families together. So they share the resources, and their kids also interact with other other children, not just completely study at home alone. Um, while the, of course those families are all middle class or upper class in, in China, so they don't really have the pressure to have to go through the college entrance examination system in China. 
they're probably going to end up just study abroad after uh, they finish high school at home. Uh, but I definitely see this as a train of, of how um, that parents, uh, people of my generation, as we are get we are becoming parents, uh, we are very aware of the limitation of the current education system. And for some of us, the alternative would be if we still want to have our kids raised in China, the alternative would be this kind of um, homeschooling program. So it sounds like when you said in the beginning that the, your answer about education in general is that you wanted to expand access to everybody. Is it's that kind of thing that you'd like to see on a more regular basis so that it's not just a few families that are able to do that with real effort and money on their part, but that it should be more of a general opportunity. Is it, do I have that right? Exactly. I would, mm -hmm. I would love to see I would love to see alternatives to this one system um, and one only route to education. Um, I think for actually this goes back to our uh, my for, uh, at the beginning I mentioned the huge um, gap between educational resources um, access to educational resources in urban and rural China. The um, in some a, a lot a lot of the rural parts of China, the students are living such a far, um, very remote area um, in the country that they have very it's very it's too far for them to go to school, and they have to in order to go to school they have to um, go to boarding school at a very young age, and um, or they, they they just simply it's also very easy for them to drop out since it's so hard to um, keep going to school. And I, I would imagine for those schools, maybe the alternative education would be, um, once it's mature, would be a really opportunity, good opportunity for them to think about remote education or education happening on a community level. Um, but this re requires much more than just education. The reform actually goes um, goes over to say if we want to set up community-based schools, then you need to have teachers, then you need to have uh, the kids' parents willing to um, spend time with kids, to mean, even if you have all the educational resources online, um, you still need the infrastructure, you still need some mentorship, um, but that is actually um, really lacking in those communities because um, most of their um, those, those students' parents are um, working um, in like large cities and in order to make, make a living for the, the kids. And the kids are usually left at home with the grandparents. Mm. So the grandparents, also hard for them to mentor the kids, provide any educational support. And there's just, for some villages, there are just no middle-aged people in that, in that village. So it's kind of hard to imagine how that community, how that village can support the kids um, if we think about those alternative models. But I, but I'm, I, I, I think the answer shouldn't be, oh, let's just all send them to a boarding school miles away from home. And then having kids starting to go to boarding school at the age of six, I don't think that's a good solution to this, this, this problem either. So how to actually cultivate, how to actually create space in the community um, that provides some support, um, either virtual or um, local, and any any kind of um, resources for the kids so that they can be at home, be with their grandparents, but also um, have the mentorship they need and the educational resources would be, I, I think it's just something really fascinates me and I would love to work on projects like that. So it seems as if you're reflecting Certainly the interest, it, Western news even think of Chinese as very focused on education. They want their kids to get mm -hmm. a decent education, however they define that. Yeah. Among the major things that are on the plate of people in Beijing who are running the entire country, mm -hmm. where do you think that stands? Because they've got environmental solu yes. issues, they've got health care solution mm -hmm. uh, problems, crises. They've got natural resources. Do we turn all the manufacturers yes. into something else? Where do you think education sits on that level? How, how when you go back, Weipu, how are you going to make this happen? Yeah, it's really hard for me to, um, to, to, to say for, you know, like I, I, I speak of the, most of the things um, I just talked 
talk to you about or speaking from my personal observation sure. or my experience. Um, so it's hard for me to actually know how, how the central government is thinking about this issue. But I, it's definitely um, a very important part of the agenda. Every um, four year, every a few years, you know, there's a national committee um, meet together and discuss the agenda for the next five years, uh, making plans. Education is always a very huge, important part of it. And I definitely see that um, there are more and more voices about pushing, uh, encouraging um, the reform, a reform for um, the entrance examination, um, college entrance examination system in China. So people are uh, talking about this constantly. There are more and more awareness uh, around this issue. So um, I, th and and as I said, um, those em the emergence of those uh, alternative school programs and uh, when more people study abroad, I think all of that adds to the whole picture of uh, we will see um, a more diverse uh, education field in China. Um, but speaking of me, how I'm going to achieve this, I don't know, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> I think I, I'm just starting to get into the field and I don't even know where I'm going uh, to work, like which organization or company I'm going to work for. Um, but I would love to, um, so I would probably be able to answer that question, your question, in 10 years <laughs> from now, I would have a better answer. But I would love to see, um, love to help to push um, the conversation in the direction of diverse, diversity and more, just more space uh, for students in general. I have a feeling it's not going to take you 10 years <laughs> to have this, this all. You probably will. Uh, I don't know. So there are a lot of you now, that is a lot of young Chinese who have come here, studied, and now are returning. Yes. And from my conversations with people in China, it seems that that is the source of a lot of the innovative thinking that's going on. Yes. They, they have now been introduced to a kind of intellectual process here that they can apply there very well. And we mm -hmm. know that there are some companies in China that are eclipsing companies in the West in terms of their applications of innovation and the way they, just by sheer scale, can mm -hmm. make things happen. What is especially interesting to you in terms of what's happened in China since the time you left and came to school here? I know you went back and forth a couple of times, but mm -hmm. what's the thrill of what you see happening that, that makes you feel so optimistic about the country despite its challenges? I think it's just a, a general momentum in the society is very, very different from the United States. I don't, I think for people who have never been to China, it's hard to imagine growing up in an environment in a society like China where you see buildings constantly just, just, you know, break, break every day there are new things emerging in your city. Every day. Um, and every year I went back to my hometown and I can't recognize some part of my hometown. That's how the city expands so so rapidly, which means there are more business coming, there are more infrastructure building, and there there are more. There are just a lot of momentum of social development uh, throughout the country, and I I was so used to that. Um, so when I was first came to here, I'm like. Oh, United States is such a peaceful and low-paced society. Nothing seems to be changing. That's just how I feel. Of course, there's always movement. There's always changes, but it's like minor changes. I don't feel like it was as physical. Uh, those changes were as physical as in China, where you literally see, you know, buildings. Um, created every day. I remember the first time, actually it was the second time I went to Shanghai. Mm -hmm. And before that, somebody said to me, have you been to Shanghai? And I said, yes, I have. And he said, have you been there in the last six months? And I said, no. He said, then you haven't been to, then you haven't been to Shanghai. Because <laughs> it had changed so much. And, yes. and, and I found that on my next visit that that was entirely true. I think now there is a more attention being paid to some of the historical aspects of the cities that we really don't want to lose. Yes, definitely. There, um, the discourse about just keep going, keep going, keep going, and now people are actually saying, wait, wait, we now need to think about culture um, pres and preservation, about the identity of the city, and, and as well as environment issues. Um, I think China will be more um, better, you know, at handling 
will be more mature in terms of the development uh, moving forward. Uh, but I just, I, 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 I'm so used to um, that kind of momentum of the society, um, and I just like going back and leaving uh, in my hometown like for a few days, I can sort of feel that that kind of impulse that everyone is expecting something new, everyone is expecting something better for the next year. And I think that's just very different from how people here think about their city. Um, so I, I guess because of that, I, I always have the confidence in you know the, the Chinese society in general, although there are so many issues um, about you know um, every aspect of the country. But then you know it's such a huge country. It's it's kind of, kind of like every time we talk about social issues, you 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 always have to remember we're talking about the country has like 1.4 over 1.4 billion people, and you're talking about a country 30 years ago had nothing, had nothing, but have advanced so fast in the past 30, 40 years. Um, so of course there. Are, problems, their issues need to be corrected along the way. Um, but I feel like um, China is, um, Chinese people are getting, are being aware about this, um, and uh, more and more people are willing to um, also jo join the force to push the country into the right direction. So it's clear that you share the optimism that a lot of the Chinese I've talked with do about your country. The um, when you think about that here, and you said compared to here, people don't have that same sense of the the energy, the pulse, the mm -hmm. momentum that's going on. In fact, they look and decry the problems that things might have been better in the past than they are now. Mm -hmm. That's not the feeling in China. There are definitely this kind of this, uh, the same voice. Uh, there there are people saying, "Oh, things were better in the past. Things were better in the past in certain aspects." For example, one thing people mention a lot is the um, internet control or the you know public voice, uh, public opinion control. Um, it used to be yes, it used to be much more like free um, back in the eighties or even I would say before two thousand eight. It was uh, internet control was not a thing, but now you do see a tightening of the internet control. Um, so there are there are definitely issues that people are saying you know things are getting worse, um, but I think in general in general most of the aspects you you do see a lot of advancement a lot of development, um, and uh, I I think it will be a natural step for the country and for the government to move towards a more di like diverse and more uh, free environment in general. So I, I'm optimistic about it. I think it's just a process. Um, but I, I also know people who totally disagree with me, who's, who just think things are going to downhill. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, Do you have a group of young people like yourself who, that when you go back, that you'll be engaged with again, that have, most of them have probably studied in the West? Yes, yes, I do. Um, I have some high school friends who also study abroad and are now back in China. Um, I also met a lot of people uh, in my four years of college that uh, are now working in China. Um, so I think, yes, I think um, our group of people, meaning the Chinese students who study abroad in the United States, are very, we, we, we definitely um, have gained the, uh, I, I, I think the best part of the American culture is this kind of, I, if I want to do something, I would just try very hard to pursue it. I don't, we, we don't want to follow the main, the mainstream, what the society tells you, oh, you should do this, you should do that. But we, we, we really uh, use our, most of the people that I know, we u really use our years in the United States, explore the things that might attract us, just like that might interest us. And we, a lot of us have figured out our passion um, during the time in the United States. And we're just pursuing it 
um, in our ways back in China. How how many uh, how do you feel about the relationships that you formed here? Are those people that you've met that you went to school at Bryn Mawr with, the people here at TED, at Columbia, do you have relationships and friendships with them that you think will continue, and does that add some richness to this whole discussion? Oh, yeah, def absolutely. I I have friends, I have really, really good close friends back in, uh, back at Bryn Mawr. Um, I had also friends uh, from my fellowship here in Shanghai, um, as well as Columbia, and here at TED. So, at, when we're, um, I think I'm all, always like learning um, about different cultures from the people I interact with, especially after I come here at New York. It's such a diverse city, and all all countries, all cultures interact here. I have learned so much uh, from other people about um, the United States, and especially this coming election cycle. You know, I learned so much about United like American society. From just the, just following the news, um, I I think well, Bremer College was a very liberal place, and New York is also very liberal. So I assume, I again assume, American people are always like that, you know, very liberal and you know pro this kind of um, public uh, public affairs, you know, for the government to provide public service. But apparently that's not the case <laughs> as they follow this, uh, the, the discourse, the political discourse um, this year. So I'm constantly learning uh, about this society, about this world, um, which I'm just very grateful um, of having the opportunity to come here and interact with different people. If I stay in China, none of that conversation, or very little of those conversations would have happened. Um, so I think it's it's true for me and true for most of the people, um, most of my cohort who share my experience. So it sounds to me as if your very experience here has altered the way that you conduct conversations among yourselves when oh, you yeah, get back definitely. to China, that uh, you can be much more freewheeling and extensive in your discourse about all sorts of subjects because that's the, sort of the nature of all the the sense of possibility yes. although it seems as if the real sense of optimism and excitement about the future could be could be thought of as something that might right now be more in china more true of chinese than it is of some Americans at least. Mm -hmm. So what are the questions that remain for you, things you'd like to know more about, about how things work here and how people even engage in conversation? Right. Um, I would really, I'm, I'm, I'm also very curious about your perspective on the discourse about China uh, as you've, um, I know you travel to uh, China um, uh, multiple times uh, and know the society pretty well and also you know, have been an expert in the field of communication and the media in general. So I would really love to know your observation about how you think the media, how American, like, what's a general American people think about China? Like, I, I, I think some people that I met, most people that I met might be, bi might, might be, might be biased in the way that I'm a Chinese in front of them. Of course, they will not. <laughs> they will not. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe that. And do you think their bias is one of? Do they fear China in your head, or do they? No, I'm just. I guess I'm just curious about um, how American people think about China, uh, or how how they think about Chinese people, because they might not tell me uh, the the like the real answers um, when they're in front of me or after in, in, engaging with me they totally change their opinion or I don't know I, I'm just very curious well my opinion uh, on this is, is probably um, it, it's certainly just my own mm -hmm. but my sense is that Americans many Americans are truly ignorant about China mm -hmm. they they know of it they certainly know where it is on the map for the most part mm -hmm. but I think some of them would be truly flabbergasted to see what has happened in China in the last couple of decades. I see. And I think there there are, while there is, but it, it, it's, it's really 
there all sides of the spectrum. There are there's never been more interest in learning Mandarin, mm -hmm. it, even in high on the high school level, which is unusual. It was not done even 30 years ago. Now there are so many kids who want to learn Chinese. On the other hand, there are many people who have become very insular in this country, mm -hmm. even young people. So it's almost as if you could describe two different worlds here. We have some that are very focused in a parochial fashion on their own school and their own town, and then we have other people who have never thought more globally. Mm -hmm. And for them, I think the the prospect of having China and its people become friends of ours is thrilling and mm -hmm. very positive. Yeah. So it's it's really, some of it is education, uh -huh. and some of it is simply curiosity. Uh -huh. And I think the very kind of experience that you've had here, we need to have more Americans, more Westerners have that experience in China as well. I, I, I think I told you that I have a daughter-in-law who went to uh, went to Stern Business School at, mm -hmm. at uh, NYU here and then went and spent a semester in Beijing. Right. And it was critically important for her. She, she had already been living in Hong Kong, but right. she said her whole view of China was, was very much impacted by that. So I think, uh, do I think there are some people that are afraid of the Chinese? I think there are people who have fears about everything that is foreign, mm -hmm. which to most of us is appalling because this is a nation of immigrants. Yes. You know, except for the American Indian, most of us have come from somewhere else, or our right. ancestors did, which is um, really quite phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So we'll see whether this experiment this grand experiment of America can continue to, to maintain what it has done so far, which is pretty pretty positive. Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm so excited about thinking about what you're up to, especially around this topic of education, because mm -hmm. uh, when you ask me my, my observations, one of them is that almost every time I've had a discussion with business leaders in China, when I've said, what are the things that worry you the most? Where do you think the biggest challenge is? Almost always, the conversation turns to education. Mm -hmm. Curiously enough, that's true in the United States. Yes. And it's also true in the UK. Yeah. That people say, gee, our problem is education. You guys have it all figured out, but we're still struggling with this. I think we all are. Yes. I think the the education system thing, you know, I, I actually really uh, agree with, you know, um, Ken Robinson, Sir Ken Robinson did a TED talk about yes. creativity and the education system. What he, one thing he said uh, in that talk was so true was that our public education system, in regardless of the country, our public um, education system is to train every student to be a scholar, a, a university professor. That's so true. If you think about the pyramid of the school system, you know the best students who did the best in, in school are always going higher, higher, and then end up doing a PhD. That's kind of the route. And we're, we're forcing every kid to follow this route. That's why I'm saying, you know, for most people, it doesn't even make sense to follow this route. That's not, that shouldn't be, you know, I, 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 sh I, I think um, what I would like to see in China and also in most of the most of the places in the world is there are multiple tracks that students can but but then students need to know what they want and there needs to be space for students to to explore their own interests at an early young age so that they will, they will be able to decide whether following that single route to the most prestigious college to do a liberal arts degree will that even make sense or not you know if I want to be a graphic designer, I might not need any of that, you know. So I, I think I think there are, there are things that I'm just very um, interested in seeing how Chinese society is responding. But also, this is a like you said, this is an issue for all the countries. It's a global question, yes. and and I think the most fun is when you think about education. If you simply treated it as a place where you get to you get to ask the question, "What if?" Mm -hmm. Every day when you come to school, yes. what if this were to happen? What if that were to happen? Right. And then then you find out that the answers to you maybe most importantly 
looked at through the lens of graphic arts or of philosophy mm -hmm. or of sports or mm -hmm. of whatever. So, yeah, Ken, I think, is, is very right. So th this has been a lot of fun for me, Kwe Pu. I, I hope, I hope uh, uh, it has shed some interest, expanded your interest as well on Definitely. what we're up to. So let me just conclude by saying you've been, we've been talking today with Kwe Pu Lee, who is an intern here at TED, working with the TEDx team here in New York and, and about to get her master's from Columbia Teachers College and she'll be returning to China where she hopes to do something significant in the educational system there and I have no doubt that she will in fact make that happen. She had a terrific four-year experience at Bryn Mawr here in the United States and has really looked at education from a lot of different viewpoints and I think you'll agree she's uh, uh, somebody who really can lead the conversation in in many important ways in China. So thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. This is Susan Bird. You've been listening to the Curated Conversations podcast, East Meets West and Vice Versa, where we explore new conversations taking place between Asia and the West.